Our next session, I would like to start uh, by introducing Emily Taylor. Uh, she's a native of South Louisiana. Uh, Emily works at the Tulane School of Architecture as an adjunct professor and design manager at the Tulane City Center. Um, I first heard about Emily and was excited that uh, she agreed to come after watching the movie that I saw actually here at Louisiana Folklife Festival uh, here on NSU's campus a couple of years ago called God's Architect. So I'm very happy to uh, welcome Emily Taylor and for her talk. And how do we advance slides? That guy? Great. Okay. Thanks. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Taylor and I'm a professor at the Tulane School of Architecture and design build manager of our sort of community outreach projects that we've got going. Um, first, I just wanted to thank Jason Church and, and the, um, the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training for hosting this conference. I think this is a really unique thing and, and I'm glad to be a small part of it. Um, I don't know that I can follow up an FBI investigation uh, very well, but hopefully this will be of some interest. Um, so this research project began when I received a travel traveling fellowship from Tulane School of Architecture to investigate uh, what I called self-made worlds of the South. This initial trip aimed to document 12 artists who were operating across the South, building diverse and colorful environments. This is a trip that was done in uh, the summer before the storm, so it was 2005. Um, so I was looking at people who took what is sometimes referred to as folk art and, and were making it spatial. They were making environments. And um, just kind of as a guide, I was going off of John Beardsley's sort of defini definition of, of these environments. And uh, specifically, they're creators who, who are not necessarily identified by themselves or others as artists and, and are untrained, um, or at least like they don't have university degrees in, in what they're doing, I guess you could say. So as a designer, this work fascinated me for reasons that some artists might study folk art. Um, in some ways, it seemed like a pure form of spatial and material expression that, that was not muddled by academic training. And I think to architects and engineers, these environments seem to be creative, bold, adventurous territory that uh, few of us really go into, or, or maybe it's territory that's been beaten out of us for fear of criticism uh, fear of liability, or just some plain desire to conform. Um, so I also had this fascination um, with the, the folks who are building these places and, and just their, like, their, their desire and their drive and, and their ability to just spend decades of their life working on, on one single piece. So uh, part of that original fellowship proposal was to look at these dozen artists who are each working autonomously without knowledge of each other and and for me, I was trying to find ways in which these, these different environments were related. So um, looking at ways that, that these folks are approaching building um, material use and, and, and ways that these kind of disparate, like colorful, amazing places are, are, are linked. So um, I set out to document these worlds and interview those builders who are still alive and still working on their spaces. And some of these uh, places included Dixie Cup castles, um, chapels, lighthouses, shoe houses, cross gardens. And I think um, although these creators were working independently, uh, usually without knowledge of each other or, or other worlds like their own, um, during this trip, some common themes started to emerge. And you, you all, this is a really well-versed crowd, so um, I'll, I'll just kind of touch briefly on, on what I found to be some common themes and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the film. So um, one of the major ways they, they started to relate was just in materials, and, and I think uh, the Reverend Dennis in Vicksburg is a good example of someone who, who thinks of materials almost metaphorically. Um, for instance, he, he treats a piece of wood as if it were a brick. He'll mortar it and, and stack it along with uh, whatever other materials are, are on hand. Or he'll take a... a caulk tube and, and use it as ornament, or he'll use a school bus as if it were a chapel. And then we also have uh, folks like Floyd Banks Jr., who's got a castle in Tennessee, and many of the bricks that you see here 
um, on his castle are, are handmade bricks that he just he makes out of the the dirt and clay on his property. So, uh, although in most cases these artists are using found, donated, or handmade materials um, out of the result of some financial necessity, in some cases it, it was also born out of a very thoughtful approach to materials and the the reuse. You can see in this Finster quote that the, the idea of reusing materials as somehow weaving into this Christian narrative of redemption. So the way in which they, as, as builders, might use broken objects uh, to make something great and beautiful and new, they see as uh, related to, to, what, to what their and, uh, and our creator sort of does with, with us as, as broken souls, I suppose. Um, and then there's also this, this undercurrent of faith, I guess not undercurrent, overcurrent of faith that kind of runs through a lot of these projects. Um, even some of the places I visited, like Pasaquan in Georgia, it's not a Christian faith, but it's a very real and deep faith that drives that world. Um, so, so in nearly each of these cases, these highly personal, personalized environments are, are, are an act of faith that they're, that they're committing. And I think... Just to point out this quote of Reverend Dennis's, he, he says, God is the greatest architect, I'm only his assistant. And I think that's, that was sort of, you know, he saw God as working through him. Um, and it's also a quote that we kind of cribbed to, to be the title of the, the documentary that was to follow this research. So each of these creators uh, has a strong belief that God's directing them or even acting through them to create something that these creations are meant to reach or save others. I think in terms of form, um, there's also some unmistakable resemblances in these, these creations and local building typologies. Um, in the immediate region around, for instance, Howard Finster's um, Paradise Garden, you, you see a lot of structures that he's taking cues from. And so while he may be using uh, glass bottles, license plates, broken mirrors to, to start to uh, build these structures. In the end, formally, they're, they're really similar to a lot of the structures around him. That doesn't go for, for all of these folks, and in fact, Howard Finster has a, a very atypical building on his grounds as well, but I think often these builders are using unconventional ways, but um, maybe more familiar forms. And it may be a stretch, but I think you can even see some of this borrowing local ideas in, in this example from Reverend Dennis's place in Vicksburg, Margaret's Grocery. Um, to me, at least, at, I see a lot of resemblance between the, the kudzu forest that's directly across Highway 61 from his environment and, and the sort of spires and towers that he's building on the other side of the road. And then finally, in terms of technique, there seems to be a technique that many of these builders shared, which I think W.C. Rice articulates well here. And it's this idea of small pieces aggregating over long amounts of time to form these, these larger worlds, these larger environments. And I think, for me personally, it was just humbling um, in terms of how much time and effort was put into them and how these, these places were just kind of constantly evolving. I think as someone, as someone trained in design, you have an end goal for your plans and you, you build and you get there and you walk away and someone uses the space. And these places, they're amazing in that they're just constantly evolving. I think um, there's also this common theme of integrating text throughout the different places I visited. Um, and I think a large part it is scripture. Sometimes it's also text that relates to, to how a different artist sees, um, sees the world or like their, their different world view. But a majority of the time, it, it seems to be uh, based in scripture. Like this place, Salvation Mountain, out in California. Um, and I think that integration of text has a really beautiful quality beyond just being uh, a message that they're trying to convey. So um, Kenny Hill said of his environment in, in Chauvin that his was about living and life and everything he had learned. And I think that when you look at a place like Floyd Banks' castle, you could probably apply the same, the same quote to his place. Um, his castle, he starts to embed his theories on life into the castle itself. I, I uh, don't know if y'all can read that, but I'll just read it for you. He, 
he's got this one panel that says it takes seven cares to influence one no care to become a care. It takes one no care to influence seven cares to become a no care. A society must strive to become 80-20. 50-50 won't work. And throughout his castle, there's uh, different ideas about buoyancy and gravity and uh, science. And, and it's, it's almost like this open dialogue between him and us. So just to concentrate on, on one of these for a second, uh, I'll talk a little bit about Floyd's castle that that quote was on. Um, he, in the course of this trip, I would go around and, and interview these different builders and sort of um, be with them for a little while to understand how they, the process, like what materials they were using and how they were using these. And uh, just try to kind of document some of the methods that were used to achieve, to achieve the structures that they were building. Floyd um, had this kind of inventive way of using string and whatever was on hand to, to, to lay out some of the larger towers of his castle. It's a pretty impressive structure. It's, uh, it's about 140 feet long in one direction by about 100 feet in another direction. And in the end, his idea is to enclose it as a square, you know, sort of castle plan. But right now, it's sort of this L-shaped, um, almost Piranesian space. So um, I think part of my frustration in this trip was that I could, I could take photographs and I could make drawings and I could interview these different builders and record what they were saying, but ultimately um, what I was failing to capture was just like that person's essence, which was a huge part of the, the spaces in and of themselves, and, and a huge part of understanding the, the space was understanding them. So uh, when I got back home, I, I talked to a friend of mine, Zach Godshall, who is a, a professor at Louisiana State University, and he had just finished a film which was premiering at Sundance and kind of looking at um, what he might do next. And so I told him some of these stories, showed him some pictures, and he was just like, he was really interested and, and uh, <laughs> started to dedicate his weekends and free time to hitting the road and interviewing these different builders. So Zach spent three years of his weekends and, and spare time uh, conducting these interviews and, and editing it together into a film um, a documentary that we called God's Architects. Um, and in that film, he didn't, he didn't try to tackle all 12 of these different builders. We, we basically concentrated on um, five different environments where the builder was actually alive and could be interviewed or, or someone nearby that knew a lot about the, the, the world could be interviewed. And so in the end, um, we threw in, obviously California is not in the South. We, we threw in that wild card because it was just such a compelling um, place and such a compelling person. So um, let's see here. Yeah, in the end, we ended up with this feature length documentary that I think, I hope tells a, a very straightforward and, and truthful tale about these folks. We, we attempted, we tried really hard not to, not to like um, pass judgment or put words into the mouths of these folks that, that that were incorrect, and I think Zach did a lovely job of spending a lot of time with these individual builders and really um, really getting some candid moments on, on film. I think w when I say that um, we didn't try to pass judgment, I guess what I'm referring to is a lot of times when we would show this film, one of the questions that comes up is, you know, are these folks crazy? Are they, like, I don't know, like some people that they just don't, they have no concept of, of how to, like how to understand what they're seeing. And Zach and I weren't attempting to make any, any assumptions about, about sanity or insanity or um, whether or not they, these folks were actually talking to God. Um, we just sort of took them at face value and tried to present their story in a way that was, was as honest as we could be. So um, I'm gonna show a quick little clip. Uh, it's just about 90 seconds. And I'll just do a little summary, and we can have some questions. Let's hope this works. Oh, sorry. I'm using this computer like it's a Mac. The things that have fallen into place had to be. Had to be. 
divine or guided. It's just like a part of man. Can we turn on the lights? This uh, nation. So sorry that was kind of dark. Um, you can see it on the website if you want the full color version. Um, so I guess I think what I just wanted to say to me the most striking aspect of many of these folks and their and their is just their extreme earnestness and devotion to their work, their creativity and their ability to make something out of what much of our society regards as useless. Um, I think there's a real inventiveness to how they use materials and a real desire to use this work as a way to reach others. And although they see their work as God's expression, I think in many cases these worlds can be understood as their own personal journeys through, through faith and life. Um, unfortunately, of, of the five places that, um, that we looked into for the film or, the, or that we documented in the film, several of those... Uh, Creators have, have passed on or um, have had to go into convalescent homes or, or nursing homes. And so I think of those five original places, only two are still sort of active and, and being built. And I think in the case of Reverend Dennis, uh, I, I don't actually have the most recent update. It's been six months or so since, since I gave them a call. But um, his, is a, his is an environment that has been sort of it's been looted, um, it's been, things have been taken, and it's sort of falling into disrepair. The land was given over to his church, but the church doesn't have the capacity to do much about it. And I think in this economy, it's hard to find a nonprofit that can step in and, and uh, sort of save the place and, and maybe give it over. I know in, in the in case of Kenny Hill down in Chauvin, Louisiana, the uh, Kohler Foundation stepped in and bought the land and gave it to Nickel State to be caretakers. And they've done a lovely job. They've done a really good job of, of keeping that place uh, in a good state. But I think in the case of Margaret's Grocery and some of the other places that we visited, um, it's sort of like on a slow decline or uh, in some cases not. The community loves the Reverend and, and, um, and his place. There seem, they seem to have embraced it finally. But um, in some cases on that original trip, I would, I would show up to a place and